the real. There is another curious point that should be mentioned here. Stavrakakis' reproach that I obliterate negativity. In my work, negativity magically disappears in the positivity of the act. Is, as Stavrakakis himself notes, the exact opposite of Peter Hallwood's critique of my work. Hallwood's reproach concerns my alleged morbid fascination with negativity, the death drive, and so on, which misses the positivity of the event. Is this not strange? Two critical readings of the same work which attribute to me exactly opposite positions. Is the conclusion that imposes itself not that both of my critics merely use my theory as a kind of token to fill in a pre-established place in their matrix of wrong positions? Why then does Stavrakakis have to stick so stubbornly to the ridiculous notion of the act imputed to me? Obviously, it is not the case that the difference is only verbal, a mere misunderstanding. It is not that Stavrakakis and I claim the same thing, and that he has merely misread me. His perversion is conditioned by a weakness in his basic theoretical apparatus, a fault line which also prevents him from articulating a viable political project, so that all he offers is a new version of the old Freudo-Marxist platitudes. This basic weakness is discernible already in his brief methodological reflection in the introduction, where he draws attention to the circularity of positive sciences which claim that their theories fully reflect reality and are proven by facts, thereby neglecting how the objective facts to which they refer are not the direct pre-symbolic real, but a real which is already mediated, constructed by the symbolic. Contrary to a popular unconditional enlightenment optimism, knowledge in general is never adequate, something always escapes. It looks as if theory is a straitjacket unable to contain our vibrant and unpredictable field of real experience. The underlying premise is here the identification of the couple knowledge experience with the couple symbolic real. One should assert the constitutive tension between knowledge and experience, symbolic and real. The Lacanian couple symbolic real is thus reduced to the common sense empiricist motif, theories are grey while the tree of life is green. Our knowledge is always limited, it cannot ever fully encompass and account for the wealth of experience. Since, however, one cannot step out of knowledge and directly grasp the real, one should go on, pursuing the endless task of symbolizing the real, with the full awareness that every determinate symbolization is unstable, temporary, that it will be sooner or later destabilized through some traumatic encounter with the real. In the face of the irreducibility of the real of experience, we seem to have no other option but to symbolize, to keep on symbolizing, trying to enact a positive encircling of negativity. But this should not be a phantasmatic symbolization, attempting to mortify the real of experience. It will have to articulate a set of symbolic gestures, positivizations, that will include a recognition of the real limits of the symbolic, the real limits of theory, and attempts symbolically to institutionalize real lack, the negative trace of experience, or rather of our failure to neutralize experience. We thus end with what Hegel called spurious infinity. The subject strives to fill in the constitutive lack and provide an identity for itself through symbolic and imaginary identifications. However, no identification can produce a full identity. Lack always re-emerges. Stavrakakis is here not radical enough in pursuing his own premise. Every symbolic field needs a signifier of lack to suture itself. As Spinoza already recognized, in traditional religion, God is such a signifier. From the standpoint of true knowledge, God has no positive content. The signifier merely positivizes our ignorance. In short, although Stavrakakis endlessly varies the motif of how I do not take into account the possibility of lack itself being symbolized, positivized, institutionalized, he himself does not see it where it already operates. There is nothing inherently subversive or progressive in the notion of the signifier of lack. Is the figure of the Jew in anti-Semitism not its supreme ideological example? This figure has no consistent positive content. What holds it together is the name Jew as the empty signifier. That is to say, the structure is here the same as that of the good old Polish anti-communist joke, from the epoch of really existing socialism. Socialism is a synthesis of the greatest achievements of all previous modes of production. From pre-class tribal society, it takes primitivism, 
From the Asiatic mode of production, it takes despotism. From antiquity, it takes slavery. From feudalism, it takes the social domination of lords over serfs. From capitalism, it takes exploitation. And from socialism, it takes the name. The anti-Semitic figure of the Jew takes from great capitalists their wealth and social control. From the hedonists, sexual debauchery. From commercialized popular culture and the yellow press, their vulgarity. From the lower classes, their filth and bad smell. From intellectuals, their corrupted sophistry. And from Jews, their name. It is this intervention of the pure, empty signifier which engenders the mysterious X, the je ne sais quoi which makes Jews Jews. For a true anti-Semite, a Jew is not simply corrupt, promiscuous, and so on. He is corrupt, promiscuous, etc., because he is a Jew. In this sense, Jew is, within the anti-Semitic discourse, clearly a signifier of lack, the lack in the other. Consequently, Stavrakakis's equation of the real, with the experience of the excess of reality over its symbolization, has nothing to do with the Lacanian, or for that matter, Lechloian, real. The Lechloian antagonism is not the positivity of the real outside the symbolic. It is totally inherent to the symbolic, its imminent crack or impossibility. The real is not the transcendent substantial reality which, from outside, disturbs the symbolic balance, but the imminent obstacle, stumbling block, of the symbolic order itself. This empiricist misreading of the Lacanian real accounts for Stavrakakis's strange use of negativity. The real as the excess of experience over its symbolization is negative only in the superficial sense that it undermines symbolization, since it functions as the otherness which resists it. In itself, however, this real is a positivity of the exuberant wealth of experience. For Lacan, things are exactly opposite. It is true that the early Lacan, in his first seminars, sometimes uses the real to designate pre-symbolic reality. However, this real is the pure positivity of being without any lack, as Lacan repeats again and again in these years. Rien ne manque dans le réel. Lack is introduced only by the symbolic. This is why, for Lacan, negativity is not the real undermining the symbolic from outside, but the symbolic itself. The process of symbolization with its violent abstraction, reduction of the wealth of experience to the signifying traite unaire. Lacan quotes Hegel, a word is the murder of the thing it designates, its mortification. For Lacan, the elementary form of negativity is thus not the excess of experience over its symbolization, but the very gap that separates symbolization from experienced reality. Recall the big photo of an elephant on the cover of the French edition of Lacan's first seminar, The elephant is here in its signifier. Even if there is no real element roaming around, this brutal reduction of the real elephant to its signifier is negativity, or the death drive, at its purest. Although Lacan later shifts his position, the death drive is later defined as the symbolic system itself, which operates autonomously, ignoring reality. Finally, the death drive is conceived as the real which resists symbolization. The real remains imminent to the symbolic, its inherent traumatic core. There is no real without the symbolic. It is the emergence of the symbolic which introduces into reality the gap of the real. It is thus touching to find someone who can still think and write, as if Hegel had not existed. And not only Hegel, what about Lacan's notion of the matheme, of the scientific real as the set of mathematized formulae opposed to imaginary experience? This is why Lacan strictly opposes scientific knowledge in the real to imaginary hermeneutic understanding. Furthermore, Stavrakakis's approach also misses the properly dialectical relationship between theory and practice in psychoanalysis. Freud's claim was that psychoanalysis would only be fully possible in a society which would no longer need it, so that psychoanalytic theory is not only the theory of what goes on in the analytic practice, the theory of the conditions of possibility of practice, but simultaneously the theory of its impossibility, of why practice is always open to failure, even doomed to fail. In this sense, it is not simply practice which is in excess over theory, it is theory which conceptualizes the limit of practice. It's real. Because he neglects this real, not merely symbolic, status of scientific knowledge, Stavrakakis identifies knowledge and understanding. In the same line of thought regarding the limitation of knowledge, He mentions Lacan's warning that 
one of the things we must guard most against is to understand too much. However, Lacan's point here is not, as Stavrakakis claims, that the registering of the limits of understanding allows for a better, or rather a different, type of understanding. When Lacan talks about a kind of refusal of understanding, he opposes understanding and analytic knowledge. The aim of analysis is not to understand the patient, to provide the hidden meanings of his signifiers, but, on the contrary, to reduce meaning to the signifying nonsense, as he puts it in his Seminar 11. The key point here is that the Lacanian real, in its opposition to the symbolic, has nothing whatsoever to do with the standard empiricist, or phenomenological, or historicist, or Levin's philosophy topic of the wealth of reality that cannot be reduced to abstract conceptual determinations. The Lacanian real is even more reductionist than any symbolic structure. We touch it when we subtract from a symbolic field all the wealth of its differences, reducing it to a minimum of antagonism. It is because of this minimalist, purely formal and insubstantial, status of the real that, for Lacan, repetition precedes repression. Or, as Deleuze put it succinctly, we do not repeat because we repress, we repress because we repeat. It is not that first we repress some traumatic content, and then, since we are unable to remember it and thus to clarify our relationship to it, this content continues to haunt us, repeating itself in disguised forms. If the real is a minimal difference, then repetition, that establishes this difference, is primordial. The primacy of repression emerges with the reification of the real into a thing that resists symbolization. Only then does it appear that the excluded, repressed real insists and repeats itself. The real is primordially nothing but the gap that separates a thing from itself, the gap of repetition. The consequence of this is also the inversion of the relationship between repetition and re-memorialization. Freud's famous motto, what we do not remember we are compelled to repeat, should thus be turned upside down. What we are unable to repeat, we are haunted by and are compelled to remember. The way to get rid of a past trauma is not to remember it, but to fully repeat it in the Kierkegaardian sense. What is Deleuzean pure difference at its purest, if we may put it in this tautological way? It is the purely virtual difference of an entity which repeats itself as totally identical with regard to its actual properties. There are significant differences in the virtual intensities expressed in our actual sensations. These differences do not correspond to actual recognizable differences. That the shade of pink has changed in an identifiable way is not all important. It is that the change is a sign of a rearrangement of an infinity of other actual and virtual relations. Is not such a pure difference what takes place in the repetition of the same actual melodic line in Robert Schumann's Humoresque? This piece is to be read against the background of the gradual loss of the voice in Schumann's songs. It is not a simple piano piece, but a song without the vocal line, with the vocal line reduced to silence, so that all we in fact hear is the piano accompaniment. This is how one should read the famous inner voice, Inere Stimme, added by Schumann, in the written score, as a third line between the two piano lines, higher and lower, as the vocal melodic line which remains a non-vocalized inner voice, which exists only as Augen music, music for the eyes only, in the guise of written notes. This absent melody is to be reconstructed on the basis of the fact that the first and third levels, the right and the left hand piano lines, do not relate to each other directly. That is, their relationship is not that of an immediate mirroring. In order to account for their interconnection, one is thus compelled to reconstruct a third virtual intermediate level melodic line, which, for structural reasons, cannot be played. Schumann brings this procedure of absent melody to an apparently absurd self-reference when, later in the same fragment of Humoresque, he repeats the same two effectively played melodic lines. Yet this time the score contains no third absent melodic line, no inner voice. What is absent here is the absent melody, namely absence itself. How are we to play these notes when, at the level of what is in fact to be played, they exactly repeat the previous notes? 
the effectively played notes are deprived only of what is not there, of their constitutive lack. Or, to refer to the Bible, they lose even that which they never had. The true pianist should thus have the savoir-faire to play the existing positive notes in such a way that one would be able to discern the echo of the accompanying non-played silent virtual notes or their absence. This, then, is pure difference. The nothing actual, the virtual background, which accounts for the difference of the two melodic lines. This logic of virtual difference can also be discerned in another paradox. The cinematic version of Edgar Doctorow's Billy Bathgate is basically a failure, but an interesting one. A failure which nonetheless evokes in the viewer the spectre of the much better novel. However, when one then goes on to read the novel on which the film is based, one is disappointed. This is not the novel the film evoked as the standard with regard to which it failed. The repetition of a failed novel in the failed film thus gives rise to a third, purely virtual element, the better novel. This is an exemplary case of what Deleuze deploys in the crucial pages of his Difference and Repetition. While it may seem that the two presents are successive, at a variable distance apart in the series of reels, in fact they form, rather, two real series which coexist in relation to a virtual object of another kind, one which constantly circulates and is displaced in them. Repetition is constituted not from one present to another, but between the two coexistent series that these presents form in function of the virtual object. Object equals X. With regard to Billy Bathgate, the film does not repeat the novel on which it is based. Rather, they both repeat the unrepeatable virtual X, the true novel whose spectre is engendered in the passage from the actual novel to the film. The underlying movement is here more complex than it may appear, it is not that we should simply conceive the starting point, the novel, as an open work full of possibilities which can be deployed later, actualized in later versions, or even worse, that we should conceive the original work as a pretext which can later be incorporated in other contexts and given a meaning totally different from the original one. What is missing here is the retroactive backwards movement that was first described by Henri Bergson, a key reference for Deleuze. In his Two Sources of Morality and Religion, Bergson describes the strange sensation he experienced on August the 4th, 1914, when war was declared between France and Germany. In spite of my turmoil, and although a war, even a victorious one, appeared to me as a catastrophe, I experienced what William James spoke about, a feeling of admiration for the facility of the passage from the abstract to the concrete. Who would have thought that such a formidable event can emerge in reality with so little fuss? Crucial is here the modality of the break between before and after. Before its outburst, the war appeared to Berkson simultaneously probable and impossible, a complex and contradictory notion which persisted to the end. After its outburst, it all of a sudden becomes real and possible, and the paradox resides in this retroactive appearance of probability. I never pretended that one can insert reality into the past and thus work backwards in time. However, one can without any doubt insert there the possible, or rather, at every moment, the possible inserts itself there. Insofar as unpredictable and new reality creates itself, its image reflects itself behind itself in the indefinite past. This new reality finds itself all the time having been possible, but it is only at the precise moment of its actual emergence that it begins to always have been. And this is why I say that its possibility, which does not precede its reality, will have preceded it once this reality emerges. And this is what takes place in the example of Billy Bathgate. The film inserts back into the novel the possibility of a different, much better novel. And do we not encounter a similar logic in the relationship between Stalinism and Leninism? Here also three moments are in play. Lenin's politics before the Stalinist takeover. Stalinist politics, the spectre of Leninism retroactively generated by Stalinism in its official Stalinist version, but also in the version critical of Stalinism, as when, in the process of de-Stalinization in the USSR, the motto evoked was that of the return to original Leninist principles. One should therefore stop the ridiculous game of opposing the Stalinist terror to the authentic Leninist legacy betrayed by Stalinism. 
Leninism is a thoroughly Stalinist notion. The gesture of projecting the emancipatory utopian potential of Stalinism backwards into a preceding time signals the incapacity of the line of thought in enduring the absolute contradiction, the unbearable tension, inherent to the Stalinist project itself. It is therefore crucial to distinguish Leninism as the authentic core of Stalinism from the actual political practice and ideology of Lenin's period. The actual greatness of Lenin is not the same as the Stalinist authentic myth of Leninism. And the irony is that this logic of repetition, elaborated by Deleuze, the anti-Hegelian par excellence, is at the very core of the Hegelian dialectic. It relies on the properly dialectical relationship between temporal reality and the eternal absolute. The eternal absolute is the immobile point of reference around which temporal figurations circulate, their presupposition. However, precisely as such, it is posited by these temporal figurations since it does not pre-exist them. It emerges in the gap between the first and the second, in the case of Billy Bathgate, between the novel and its repetition in the film. Or, back to humoresque, the eternal absolute is the third unplayed melodic line, the point of reference of the two lines played in reality. It is absolute but fragile. If the two positive lines are played wrongly, it disappears. This is what one is tempted to call materialist theology, the notion that temporal succession itself creates eternity. <laughs>